of what we're going through now, <clears throat> I was thinking this last week of um, World War II, for example. 17, 18, 19-year-old young men left their homes knowing that there was an overwhelming possibility that they would never return. And they went. And all throughout our history, <clears throat> We have had individuals that loved liberty more than their life. And liberty is not given. Liberty is purchased and protected through a, a diligent fight. <clears throat> and, and it isn't made by seeking safety. And it does us well to have a day set aside to remember those that gave their lives for our liberty, and then it ought to make us be reminded that our liberty in Christ is only made possible through Christ. Amen. And he paid the ultimate sacrifice for our liberty and the reality of that and so as we go to prayer, I want you to thank God. And you know, every life that was given, I was thinking about that this last week, every life that was given, there was a home that somebody knocked on the door. And immediately when they looked out the window, they knew that their son was never coming home. I mean, you think of that. And those people had a direct interest in the fight for liberty. And, and we owe this great, great, um, we owe a great, great debt to those that have given their lives on our behalf. And it ought to challenge us to the reality that we have been entrusted with liberty and what are we doing with it <clears throat> and what does God want us to do with it but let's just pa pause right now for prayer on this memorial weekend Heavenly Father <clears throat> we are overwhelmed when we think about the liberty that we have enjoyed in this country that began <clears throat> with the Revolutionary War and has continued down through the years and the battle physically that takes place and the battle spiritually. But Lord, we pause right now and ask that you would bless those families who have given those that are dearest to them in service for this country and in liberty. And Lord, I pray <clears throat> that even our pausing to think about this and to think of the ramifications of it would stir us to the reality of what we have been entrusted. And Lord, that we would have a serious pursuit of you as to how you want us to represent you in this land of liberty. Lord, thank you for the wisdom that you gave our founding fathers in establishing this republic. And Lord, we pray that as we have been entrusted with this great gift, that we would be wise caretakers of it. And Lord, we thank you with the utmost thanksgiving for the giving of your son to purchase our salvation. And Lord, where the spirit of you is, there is liberty. And Lord, we thank you for the liberty that we have in Jesus Christ. 
And I pray that we would be wise in this trust of the gospel that you have given to us. And that we would live in thanksgiving. <clears throat> that we would share this liberty with others. <clears throat> and Lord, that you would be honored as we pursue you with all our hearts. Lord, we ask your blessing on this time, <clears throat> and we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Jason's going to come and lead us in America the Beautiful, and as we sing it, we want you to be uh, giving thanks for those that uh, gave their life and for our liberty as we sing together. <clears throat> Let's sing America the Beautiful. to give strength to all. 
Now therefore, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? For all things come from you and of your own we have given you. For we are all aliens and pilgrims before you as were all our fathers. Our days on earth are as a shadow and without hope. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have prepared to build you a house for your holy name is from your hand and is all your own. I know also, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. As for me, in the uprightness of my heart, I have willingly offered all these things. And now with joy I have seen your people who are present here to offer willingly to you. O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, keep this forever in the intent of the thoughts of the heart of your people and fix their heart toward you. And give my son Solomon a loyal heart to keep your commandments and your testimonies and your statutes to do all these things and to build the temple for which I have made provision. Then David said to the, all the assembly, Now bless the Lord your God. So all the assembly blessed the Lord God of their fathers and bowed their heads and prostrated themselves before the Lord, the King. David, you notice, over and over refers to him, God, as the King, and yours is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty forever and ever. And, and calling to the greatness of God. You think of that as we sing these next songs. Let's sing the chorus, Awesome God, Our God is an Awesome God.
At the beginning of this year, we said that we want to know God and to make Him known. And one of the one of the reasons for the study of the attributes of God is to help us to know God. And, and so far in our studies of the attributes of God, we've seen that God is self-existent, that He's incomprehensible, that He's infinite, that He's unchangeable, He is holy, He is all-powerful, ever-present, all-knowing, all-wise, He is good, He is long-suffering, We've seen that He is a God of wrath. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of love. He is a God of judgment. And last week we saw that He is the sovereign God. And, and to sum it all up, throughout the Bible you will find, as we read earlier, that a term is often used that God is majestic. And unless you you look to focus on it, you don't realize how much that word is used in the Bible to describe God. Now when you think of, of majestic, there's probably a few things that come to your mind. Um, by, I'm not thinking specifically few things, I'm saying in number, there's not many things that we say are majestic. And you think about majestic, majesty, that's, that's hard to put a term and define it, but it's, it's like something that you know what it is, or you have a pretty good idea, and you know what it is. When I, the first thing that comes to my mind when I think of majestic are mountains and the picture that you have there last summer we were out west and we drove by where we used to live in Livingston and I said I gotta stop and I wanted to go inside the house we lived and take a picture from the window but I didn't dare go up and ask that so I just stood in the middle of the street that was the view and every morning I get up and look out our picture window that was the Paradise Mountains if you go look to the west, you'd see the wine glass mountains. If you go look out the east window, you'd see the crazy mountains. And when I, um, there are crazy mountains, every mountain has stories about a, cra a, a woman that went crazy up in the mountain. And that's why, they, honestly, you go, we go to Colorado and there's this story about some woman that went crazy up in the mountain. So, at um, any rate, when I think of mountains and majesty, I mean, there, there's something to me that it's, you just stand in awe. I mean, it's, it's so big, it's so overpowering. Um, how many of you have been to the Niagara Falls? That's kind of the same thing, kind of majestic. It's like, whoa, all this all this power and all this force and um, how many of you have been to the Grand Canyon? Now to me the Grand Canyon it was great it was needless to say it's big but I don't think of the Grand Canyon as majestic that's just my personal you may and I'm not going to argue with you that's nothing to argue about okay but it is it's overwhelming but it's a big hole to me okay um, and and yet that shows my ignorance because there's um, so much history that is there and God's power is seen there <clears throat> I'm, I've never seen other than at a circus and now you won't see these at circuses anymore but I also think of lions as majestic. I mean, they are the king, God tells us, of the animal kingdom. And you know, you just, you just picture this lion. He knows he's the boss walking around here and anything he wants, 
If he makes up his mind, I can go eat it, snap its neck in one little bite, and gone. It, I mean, there's something majestic about, about a lion. But often when we think of the term majestic, we don't think of God. And God is overwhelmingly far more majestic than any mountains, Amen. than any waterfalls. Um, sunrises and sunsets are awe-inspiring and, and they cause you to just at times speechless. But any of these created things are nothing compared to the majesty of God. The English word majesty comes from Latin words which mean greatness and dignity. And in the Bible, the Hebrew word that is used, it defines it as, um, as a sense of, uh, it, it's hard for us to put into words, but it defines it as a sense of pride. In, in this sense, in Psalm 93 in verse 1, it says, The Lord reigns, he is, he is clothed in majesty. And, and the word that is used there is a sense of, of pride in the positive sense that only God can have because our pride, we are not responsible for all that we are. God is the one that is responsible. So any pride that we take is a false pride. And you might say, well, I work really hard. Well, it's God that gave you the ability to work. It's God that gave you the opportunity to work. And it's God that has blessed your work. There are people all over the world that have worked very, very hard and don't have two nickels to rub together. And anything that we take pride in is directly God. But when God takes pride in the, in, and this is the term that is used in the, in the good sense that this is who I am. He is the greatest. Amen. And, and he is, has no one to even compare to him. So as a lion, so to speak, he, he goes about, but he doesn't. He, he goes about in meekness, but he is the great one. Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali, some of you remember him. I am the greatest of all times. Well, he may have been the greatest boxer for a few months or years. It depends. I mean, greatest. There may have been someone somewhere else around the world that no one ever knew about that could have cleaned his clock. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and when we think we're the greatest, we have no idea what else is out there but only one can say I am the greatest Amen. and that's the majesty of the God that we serve and and it's amazing the word doesn't convey God's pride in in himself rather it stands for God's reputation among the people from which he deserves the glory that it is right to think the highest of God. Amen. That's, what, that's what it's saying. Now, humanly speaking, majesty is an attribute that is unique to king, kings. Um, we don't live in a land where we have kings, but where there throughout history, where there was a king, they would say, your majesty the king. And, and it was attributed to them because they were the highest power in their land. The first mention of this word majesty is in the passage that we read where David said, 
Yours, O Lord, is the greatness. And notice these words that he's using. Verse 11, yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, and the glory, the victory, and the majesty for all that is in heaven and in earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head over all. He's using all these terms to try to help us understand, wow, he is the greatest. I mean, he says, you're the greatness, all the power, all the glory, the victory, majesty. It's your kingdom. The heaven is yours. The earth is yours. You are exalted over all. And he goes on, riches and honor and all these things. So he uses the term there to describe God. I want to just call your attention to a few others. Turn to Psalm 29. Psalm 29. <clears throat> And verse 4, the voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. I can't wait till I hear the voice of the Lord. Amen. I mean, the voice of the Lord makes, makes the mountains tremble. And it says, the voice of of the Lord is full of majesty. When we hear his voice, we will stand in awe. Amen. I mean, this is, this is God. I remember a few years ago, and I don't remember if it was one of the cantatas, and, and um, it was God saying something. And we had Dave Faisal. Yeah. Where were you? Were you back? back in there no one saw him and in the part then it it came for God to say something and Dave Faisal this is the Lord and everyone you know. <laughs> when God speaks it's not going to be Dave Faisal <laughs> I mean that, this is noteworthy that the psalmist says that his voice, the voice of the Lord, is full of majesty. I mean, he is, he is trying to make it understand how great this God is. He's full of power. Turn to Psalm 93. We, we mentioned it just a moment ago. But Psalm 93 and verse 1, the psalmist again says, The Lord reigns. That was true in the psalmist's day, and it's true today, May 24th, 2020, China virus, whatever virus, whatever economic, God reigns. But notice what he said, the Lord reigns and his, he is clothed with majesty. I mean, everything about him is majestic, is is awe-inspiring, is breathtaking. It's like, whoa! He's clothed in majesty. And he, he uses that same term in Psalm 104. But look at, at verse, um, at Psalm 96 and verse 6. Honor and majesty are before him, strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Notice, I mean, to come into his presence, it is filled with honor and majesty. It is filled with strength and beauty. We even have a hard time putting those things together. But this is, this is our God. This is who we're serving. This is why we're meeting today to celebrate our God, the resurrected Savior, and He's clothed in majesty, and in His presence is majesty, and His voice is majestic. It is full of majesty. You remember the account of Job, and near the end, God came to Job and He said, Job, 
you and your buddies in essence think you're so great and the Lord said um, I have some questions for you Job <clears throat> and Job began asking or God began asking Job many questions and in verse 10 in the midst of that God is saying to him he said can you thunder in verse 9 can you thunder with a voice like God's he's asking Job all these things that Job can't do and then in verse 10 he says then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor and array yourself with glory and beauty Job I'm just going to show you the difference between me and you can your voice thunder? We may be hearing some of it later today, okay? All these questions. No, I can't. Job, go adorn yourself, he said, with majesty and splendor. I don't care if you have an unlimited budget. It doesn't matter the clothes you put on. Adorning goes deeper than the clothes. Amen. And the adorning is all of these attributes of God that we have mentioned. His love and His mercy and His justice and His infinite. And all of those attributes, they just flow from the presence of God. And He is adorned with majesty. He is, He is so great. And, and Job said, no, I can't. I can't adorn myself with majesty. It's interesting. Peter, of all people, Peter, in 2 Peter chapter 1 and 6, verse 16, alluded to the majesty of God. He said the false teachers will come to get you and lead you astray, but he said, Peter said, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he says, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 16. Peter was there on the Mount of Transfiguration. He caught a little glimpse and Peter said, we weren't telling you fables. We weren't making up stuff about God. We were eyewitnesses, and the term that he used is his majesty, his awe-inspiring greatness. The book of Jude is closed with this, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen and amen. <clears throat> you know, there have been, humanly speaking, some great minds throughout history. There have been great athletes, great inventors, great people, humanly speaking. But every one of them comes to a point where their greatness, humanly speaking, subsides. And, and they're just a, a shadow of what they used to be until the point they're gone. And people may remember them or may not remember them, that may be greatness, humanly speaking, but that is not majesty. Majesty never diminishes. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 8. Our God is a God of majesty. Notice Psalm 8. This is a psalm of the glory of God in creation. Notice what the psalmist says, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. 
who have set your glory above the heavens. Out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants you have ordained strength because of your enemies, that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you visitest him? For you have made him a little lower than the angels, and have crowned him with glory and honor. And it, you have made him man to have dominion over the work of your hands, and have put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the fowls of the air, the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. The first word in the Hebrew text in Psalm 8 embodies the majesty and the glory of the Lord. Um, while our English Bible render it, O oh Lord, in the Hebrew, it's represented by four capital letters, Y-H-W-H. -H. It, it was a reference, we refer to it as Yahweh, but, but the Hebrews... It was, it was a holiness of, of God that they never spoke that word. That's why it was just those four initials that are translated initials in ours um, because his name was and still is so holy that they would never speak it audibly. Um, the second Lord, O Lord, the second one, our Lord is the word Adonai, which is a title of respect and recognition of authority. So they, they often would translate this as majestic, meaning mightier than anything else. So Combining all this, the psalmist is saying, God, you are separate from man. You are mightier than everything else. And he declares that from the very beginning, God has no rival. He is subject to no power. And he reigns supreme. And in this passage... He says, God defeats the, his foes with the weakness of children. You notice we said, out of the mouths of, of babes and sucklings, you have ordained strength because, you, because of your enemies that you might steal the enemies and the avengers. And he also says, out of the weakness of man, he rules the earth. This is how great God is. He takes the weakness of babies and the weakness of man and he stills the avenger and he rules the earth. And it says, when I consider your heavens, the heavens of God. Sir Isaac Newton had an exact replica of the solar system made in miniature. Needless to say, made in miniature, okay? <laughs> Kind of redundant to say that, right? <laughs> At its center, of course, was a golden ball representing the sun. Revolving around it were small, small spheres of planets attached at the ends of rods of varying lengths. And they were all geared by cogs and belts to make them to move around the sun in harmony. I mean, it was quite, quite uh, an invention or um, replica that he put together. And one day Newton was studying the model and a friend of his who did not believe in the biblical account of creation stopped by. And the friend was looking at this model and watching as Newton made the heavenly bodies move in their orbits and the man exclaimed mr newton what an exquisite thing who made it for you without looking up 
Newton replied, nobody. Nobody, his friend asked. That's right, I said nobody. All of these balls and belts and cogs and gears, they just happen to come together. Wonder of wonders, Newton said. By chance, they began revolving around these orbits and in perfect timing, his unbelieving friend got the message. Amen. There is a majestic God. When I consider the heavens, I mean, just this earth, it's 7,918 miles in diameter. Approximately 25,000 miles around it. I read this. I'm believing it. I'll tell you what it is. The weight is 6.6 trillion tons. We've never got to sextillion yet. Give our government a chance. They will. <laughs> that is 6.6 .6 with 20 zeros after it. That's how much it weighs. I don't know how they figured it, okay? But it weighs a lot. It travels through space at 43,000 miles an hour. That much weight traveling that fast, and it travels around the sun at a speed of 65,520 miles an hour. And you know what? It doesn't vary. When you set, when God set that baby on cruise control, it stays there. How do we know? Because we can tell to the tenth of a second when the sun's going to rise here on this earth, when it's going to set. We set our calendar by it all. When I consider the heavens, God, you are a majestic God. Years ago, a famous explorer named William Beebe, who was a good friend of then President Theodore Roosevelt, and he would often visit President Roosevelt at Sagamore Hill, and the two men would go outdoors at night, and, and they would kind of have a contest to see who could first locate a specific galaxy. Um, the galaxy was Androme Andromeda, Andromeda, I think, okay? Then as they gazed at the tiny smudge of a distant starlight, one of them would recite this. They found it. It's a tiny smudge clear off in the, in the horizon or in the universe. And this is what they would say. That is the spiral galaxy of of Andromeda. It is as large as our Milky Way. It is one of a hundred million galaxies, one of a hundred million galaxies. It is 750,000 light years away. Um, light years uh, one light year travels almost six trillion miles. So it's 750,000 times 6 trillion. That, that, what they're seeing is that far away. It consists of 100 billion suns, that galaxy consists of 100 billion suns, each larger than our own sun. Then President Roosevelt would grin and say, now, our, now I think we are small enough, let's go to bed. <laughs> you know what, when you gaze upon the majesty of God, it brings all of our life into perspective. Amen. Amen. And to understand this is, this is the God that loved us and sent his son for us. This is the amazing God that we serve. I mean, the psalmist talked about the, the amazing aspect of, of God and, and his design in human speaking. 
we don't have time to go into it, but just the human body. There is nothing as amazing as the human body. And, and just the birth, you know, it's the baby's body that in its time sends a complicated chemical to the mother's body that says, I'm ready, it's time to deliver. Meaning my lungs, my heart, my gastrointestinal system, my nervous system, my brain, they're ready to make it on its own. The brain is not yet fused together so that it can go together, pass through the birth canal. And as the process starts, the baby's adrenal glands are given a shot of stress hormones to help the baby cope with the um, birth process. You know, we hear about the mother's difficulties in it, and indeed there are, but you don't think about the stress they go through, but God has hormones already injected right at that time. I mean, this is, and that's just a little bit. The child will not breathe under a normal process until it has cleared the birth canal. If it breathed too soon, it would suffocate. But if it waited too long, it would suffer brain damage. And just before the mother and the child separates, the newborn gets a last minute blood transfusion through the umbilical cord. And in it are all the nutrients the baby needs for that exact moment and on and on and on. Our God is majestic. Amen. He is beyond compare. And we realize when Jesus Christ first came, he did not come in majesty. He came in humility. He came as a servant. But turn with me to the book of Revelation chapter 19. When Jesus Christ comes again, he comes in majesty. Amen. He comes in glory. He comes in power. And we're just going to begin reading at verse 11 of Revelation chapter 19. Now I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and, righteous, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. Sounds a little different than his first coming, doesn't it? His eyes were like flames of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one except himself knew. He was clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That is majesty right there. King of kings and Lord of lords. God's majesty should have a profound impact on our life. Let me just mention several ways it should impact us. Number one, it should humble us. Don't make the mistake of thinking God is like us. We are made in the image of God in certain ways, but God is not like us. God is majestic in all his ways. He is great. There is no rival. There is no comparison. He is far, far, far beyond us. And it should humble us. I mean, the greatest that we do, as we mentioned earlier, what's it going to last? I was going to say 80 years. It doesn't even last that. I mean, you, you may be, there may be some guys here, to young men today, that can pump out 100 push-ups. I'd like to see it after church here today, but um, <laughs> I'll guarantee you there's a day coming when they can't do that. 
And do you think, do you think God is ever impressed with man? Look at this guy set a new, new weightlifting record. Boom, boom, God said. Oh man, God says, woo! God's never impressed with man because he's majestic in all his ways. Yeah. Anything we make, I'm impressed with some of the food my wife makes. <laughs> but you know, if kale's out of it, all right? <laughs> but nothing can impress God because he is so great. It ought to humble us immensely when we see the majesty of God. Secondly, it, it ought to cause great fear. Isaiah said, and they shall go in Isaiah 2 and verse 19, and they shall go into the holes of the rocks and into the caves of the earth for fear of the Lord and for the glory of his majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. You can read the same thing in the book of Revelation. The day is coming when God in his majesty is going to rise and he's going to shake the earth. And people are going to run to the hills and the valleys and cry for them to fall on them. And when you understand the greatness and the majesty of God, it should cause us to, to respect him in a reverence and a fear. Thirdly, <clears throat> it should fill us with glorious awe. We sang, our God is an awesome God. And a number of years ago, awesome was a popular word. Awesome, awesome, hey, that's awesome. No, God is awesome. Amen. There are things that may cause awe to us like mountains or a, a, loud, a, a bright flash of lightning and a, and a booming thunder that at times, it, whoa, you know, it's like. But it's not the thunder and the lightning that's awe. It's the God of the thunder and the lightning. It's the God of the mountains. And, and it, we need... We need to take time, and I think God, what he's been doing, one of the things in this last week is, last week, last eight weeks, or whatever many weeks, I don't even know what day of the week it is. Thankfully, we're back meeting on Sunday, so you get that one right, all right? He's saying, slow her down, people. You don't even, even in Christianity, we don't take the time to stand in awe. This is our God. There's no comparison. It should cause us to trust and obey Him. Why wouldn't I trust Him? I mean, He is, he is majestic in all His ways. He is perfect in all His ways. All these attributes that we've looked at. This is God. Why wouldn't I trust Him? Amen. We get thinking we know more than... I don't know about that, God. We might never say that, but by our disobedience to him, we're saying that. Amen. When we don't trust him, if, if we knew and, and caught a glimpse of the majesty of God, it would cause us to trust and obey him. It would produce enthused worship. I mean, it would, enthuse is our English word, but it comes from the word that means in, E-N, in theos, in God. That's what produces enthusiasm. Genuine enthusiasm is when you are in God. You know, as believers, if we saw the majesty of God, no one would ever have to say, sing like you mean it, put a smile on your face, have joy, come on, come on. No. John Wesley, I read this morning, John Wesley was on a ship coming to the U.S. as a missionary, and he heard a group of Moravians singing. 
And they were singing with such joy and such passion and such enthusiasm that it made him realize, I don't have that. He was coming to America, a missionary to the Native Americans, and he realized he wasn't even saved. And he went and was a missionary, and he still wasn't saved. He went back to England, and he had this turmoil in his soul, and he went again. On Eldersgate Street, he went to a group of Moravians. He stopped in their place for a service and the same passion and enthusiasm. And he heard a message from the book of Romans and he realized that he was a law keeper and he can't keep the law and only Christ can fulfill the law. And he trusted God because of, in part, the ministry of an enthused worship. And, and I'm not limiting worship to, to corporate gatherings. In our personal time alone with God, it, it isn't going to be, well, I better read my Bible if I want things to go well with me today. No, 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 no. This is the, this is the best part of the day is time alone with God. I mean, there's many days after... Um, after we get alone with God and then get together that either Marilyn will say or I will say, well, it's downhill now the rest of the day. And it is. When you're in the presence of God, nothing can compare to that. Amen. You know, somebody said it's hard to soar with the eagles when you live with the turkeys, right? <laughs> well, we're, I'm a turkey. I'm living with myself. But in the presence of God, there is joy. It will produce enthused worship, and then it will be the subject of our talk. The psalmist said, I will speak of, the glo of glorious things of your majesty and your wondrous works. Psalm 145. He said, I will make known to the sons of men his mighty acts and the glorious majesty of his kingdom. So we ask, what's the problem? The problem is we don't know God. Amen. First of all, it says in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 14, the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God until we have been born again. The majesty of God won't mean much to us. It'll just be academic. So if you're here today and you are like John Wesley, you may be doing good things, but you know deep inside you are not a child of God. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today you need to do that. But there are many people that are children of God that the majesty of God does not mean much to him because we don't know God. We, we really don't know him. We don't think on him. We don't, we don't know him. And honestly, to know the majesty of God, you must seek him. Let me just, just quickly read Deuteronomy 4.29. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, Thou shalt find him if you seek him with all your heart. First Chronicles 16, 11. Seek the Lord and seek his strength. Seek his face continually. Psalm 34, 10. The young lions do lack and suffer hunger, but those who seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Psalm 105, verse 3. Let the heart of them rejoice that seek the Lord. Psalm 105, verse Verse 4, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face forevermore. Hosea 10, 12, break up your fallow ground. It is time to seek the Lord. It is time to seek the Lord. I think what God's telling us today, break up your fallow ground. It's time to seek the Lord. It's
it's time that, that we come to know the majesty of God. And it begins, if you're a child of God, it begins by saying, God, I want to know your majesty. I want to stand in awe of you. Matthew 6, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It, it means rearranging God I want to know you I, I and it may mean admitting God this majesty of you is foreign to me so that I am I am captured by your love and it is it's a continual seeking process he said seek him continually and that's what we need to do and I tell you when we come to see the majesty of God, everything else will grow strangely dim, Amen. as the song says. Yes. It's the majesty of God. Heavenly Father, I pray that you would help us to come to see your majesty. Lord, I first of all thank you that you are majestic in all your ways that you are clothed in majesty, that your voice is full of majesty, that, that you are majestic, that, that you are and you alone are awe-inspiring. There is, there is nothing like you. No one can even compare. And Lord, that you are willing to be my God, that you are willing to pay the ultimate price for my liberty, Lord, I pray that you would help me and every one of us to grow in the majesty of you. And Lord, that it would affect our lives, that it would affect how we trust you and obey you, that it would deal with our pride and bring a, a humbling before you, that it would be the talk of our lips the mighty, majestic works of you. So Lord, I pray that we would be committed to seeking you. And Lord, the promise that if we seek you with all our hearts, you will be found. Lord, for those that don't know you, I pray today that they would be brought to know you. And then, Lord, for each one that does, I pray today would be a day that we make a commitment and make changes in our lives to seek you with all our hearts. Lord, thank you that you are the majestic God. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you would remain seated with your heads bowed and eyes are closed, Kathy's going to play the song Majesty. And I want you to take time right now to think, okay, what is the truth today from this message that I need to apply to my life? What is the personal application to your life? And then I want you to ask, what can I do to seek the Lord with all my heart? What is the next step, God, that you want me to do? Lord, may
may your spirit accomplish your purposes in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask Jason if he'll come. We're going to sing a couple choruses about the majesty of the Lord. Majesty, worship in majesty. And then the chorus, how majestic is your name. And then we'll close our service. I'll come and, and um, talk a little bit about another song. So think of our majestic God as we sing together. All right, let's sing the song, Majesty. You 
are beautiful beyond description. Majesty enthroned above. Let's sing together. And I stand, I stand in awe of you. Stand, I stand in awe of you. Only God to whom all praise is due. I stand in awe of you. You notice as we went through that, I was thinking of the attributes of God. You are wonderful beyond com comprehension. Your infinite wisdom, the depth of your love. I mean, all the attributes of God. And if you get nothing else, I hope this song is one, I, I only have a part of the chorus down, but there's many times that I'll just go and say, God, I just stand, I stand in awe of you. Amen. I mean, that's what we need. Yes. That's what God desires. And I, I hope today and I hope this week when, when you're out pulling weeds or working or changing diapers that you are able to say, God, Let's sing it. I stand, I stand in awe of you. I stand, I stand in awe of you. Holy God, to whom all praise is due. I stand in awe of you. Amen. The day's coming when he's coming as a majestic king. And you know what? I can't wait to sing in heaven. I stand, I stand. Can you imagine from every tongue and every nation with perfect voices? That's, that's what our future is, folks. So rejoice. The majestic king is coming again. Maranatha, God bless you.